hello to everyone. Um, welcome to this um, IHRM webinar. This event is a part of um, IHRM webinar series organized by Mila Lazarova and Edna Kwan from the Center for Global Workers Strategy at Simon Fraser University in Canada. Elaine Farndale, Miguel Olivas, and Maya Vitovich from the Penn State Center for International Human Resource Studies, USA, and by Marion Festing and myself, Maral Murabekova from ECP Business School from Berlin and uh, Paris campuses. Uh, previous events of this uh, I, uh, HRM webinar series are available online at our YouTube channel, so you're welcome to watch them. And it is my great, great pleasure today to introduce Anvil Harzing. And thank you, Anvil, for accepting our invitation. Um, so I will shortly, shortly, it's not so short, but present Anvil. So Anvil's wide research interests include international HRM, exp expatriate management, uh, headquarter subsidiary relationships, cross-cultural management, transfer of HRM practices, the role of language in international business, the international research process, and the quality and impact of academic research. Uh, the volume Grand Auteur en Management International uh, devotes an entire chapter to her contributions to the field of international business. And she is the youngest academic featured in the volume, which also includes prominent IB researchers such as John Dunning, Peter Buckley, Christopher Bartlett, Seiki. Prahalat, Sumantra Gorsh, Holgert, Hofstede, and uh, Edward Hall. So in addition to her substantive and very interesting research areas, Anvil also has a keen interest in issues relating to journal quality and research performance metrics. So in this context, uh, she is the editor of the journal quality list and the provider of Publish or Perish, uh, you know, a well-known software program that retrieves and, uh, and analyzes academic citations. Anvil has published more than 160 books, book chapters, and academic papers in uh, so many journals, such as, you know, Journal of International Business Studies, Management International Review, International Business Review, Journal of World Business, and, and so on. So the list is so long, so I won't just read everything. Uh, today's presentation, Dare to be Different, Why IHRM Research Needs to Change, will be a different type of seminar. Rather than dealing with a specific research paper or one topic, Anvil will take you on a journey of what needs changing in IHRM research. So for the last part of the seminar, in addition, uh, drawing on her experience in her 30-year academic career in IHRM, Anvil will discuss how daring to be different might work out in practice and how to navigate academia as a PhD student or early career researcher. So now uh, we will watch a pre-recorded video with Anvil's presentation, and then Anvil will respond in live to your question in the end. So please don't hesitate to put all your questions in uh, Q and A. Um, we will we will disable the um, chat function. So uh, just put your question in uh, Q and A, please. So thank you, and Anvil, uh, um, please. I will start sharing my screen and. Uh, Thank you so much, Moral, for your very kind introduction, very, very fluent. Um, I've, I've watched a lot of uh, webinars in this series and I really, really enjoy them. And I'm organizing a lot of these online events myself, so I know how much work goes in, in, into these behind the scenes as well. So, so thank you very much for the whole team. Um, as Maral mentioned, uh, my webinar will be a bit unusual, not just in terms of the, the content, but also in terms of the way it's run. Um, I will be showing you a pre-recorded presentation because I have real difficulty sticking to time in live presentations. And this way we can ensure that there's enough time for, for questions. It also means I can preserve my energy for the Q&A because it's, it's fairly late in the afternoon and I've had a very full day uh, of meetings. I realize this is, is a little bit odd, but uh, you'll get used to it straight away because it's online anyway, so it won't be any different uh, than me presenting live. So I will start sharing the video now. We, we did test this uh, beforehand, but if anything goes wrong, just mention it in the, um, the Q&A, and I'm sure that one of the team will be able to troubleshoot it for you. Hello, my name is Annual Harsing and I'm a professor of international management at Middlesex University, where my main role is being a research mentor and leading our staff development program. 
This presentation will be a little different from most other presentations. I will not talk about a specific paper or, or even a specific stream of research, but rather about what I think needs to change uh, for our academic work to provide real value to the field, to other academics, but also to society at large. I will focus on international mobility research, but many of the issues that I will discuss today are relevant to international HRM research in general, or even to management or international business research in general. However, towards the end of the presentation, I will also spend a bit of time talking about positioning yourself in academia as a PhD student, and I hope that will be useful to you too. Okay, before I start, you will notice that many of the slides have URLs on them with links to blog posts with further information. You can access these through the handouts or simply by googling them and you'll find them easily. So this is where uh, the literature was when I started my PhD in the early 90s, looking back to what was published uh, from the 70s onwards. The focus was very much on expatriates only, and they were typically company-initiated expatriates. They were also typically white male expatriates who had a dependent wife and were sent out from what we call weird countries, uh, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic countries, moving to developing countries in need of skilled labor. The topics that were studied were largely expatriate adjustment and performance, uh, selection, training and compensation, so the traditional HR functions, but then applied to expatriates, and a little bit about the role of expatriation, um, such as position filling, management development, organizational coordination and control, but much of that was really descriptive. The research methods used in this period were largely surveys or um, big databases with secondary data. And the research methods used in terms of analysis were typically either descriptive or regression analysis. So in the next 20 years, uh, the field developed quite significantly, first of all, in, in terms of population. Uh, the type of expatriates uh, studied changed in terms of direction, not just moving from headquarters to subsidiaries, but also impatriates moving from subsidiaries to headquarters. In terms of demographics, looking at age, gender and sexual orientation. In terms of profession, looking at, for instance, at academics, sports expatriates, military. In terms of the length of assignment, looking at frequent travelers. Basically, name an internationally mobile group of employees and it has been studied. In addition to that, um, academics also started to become interested in migrants, mostly highly skilled migrants, but they were still mostly focused on, on Western home countries. The topics studied also remained fairly similar in terms of focusing on adjustment, selection and training, but then for all of these new groups. There was a bit of a connection though uh, with um, knowledge transfer uh, because expatriates started to be seen as key vehicles for knowledge transfer. So this led to a connection with uh, the headquarters subsidiary literature and the knowledge based view. So in these 20 years, the research methods uh, included an increasing number of interview based studies and fairly small skill surveys of these specific populations that we've just talked about. There's also quite a lot of studies on the choice between parent country nationals and host country nationals in top management teams of subsidiaries using one and the same uh, database of Japanese multinational corporations. The field really started to develop as a separate field, especially after getting uh, a specific track at the European Academy of Management. Um, and in my view, started to increasingly isolate itself from mainstream international business with a lot of specialization. This is, of course, completely natural for a field that's finding its own place and identity. But in my view, it didn't really lead to a coherent body of knowledge. So if this is where the field is at the moment, what do we need to change? Well, first of all, I think we need to look at the population. We saw that uh, the field has developed mostly by studying different types of expatriates rather than studying different topics or research methods or using different theories. However, the focus has still been very much uh, on a narrow group of elite mobile people. 
I'm by no means the first uh, who has signaled this issue. You'll find it summarized very well in this introduction of a recent book by Yvonne McNulty and Chris Brewster. So what does need changing in terms of uh, population? Well, first of all, I would say refocus and reintegrate. Self-initiated expatriation? What's the difference between that and highly skilled migrants? And why are we only studying highly skilled migrants in the first place? And why are we focusing on such a limited number of home countries? And then in terms of impatriation, can we get a little bit more sophisticated in this? For instance, the article that I've recently published with Florence Duvivier looks at how different types of international assignments can be used differently in knowledge transfer between uh, headquarters and subsidiaries, looking at long-term expatriation, short-term expatriation and impatriation and how they transfer different types of knowledge between headquarters and subsidiaries. So impatriation is not just a poor cousin of expatriation, it's a staffing strategy in its own right. So in addition to having a broader perspective on uh, the population that we're studying, I also think we need to seek better integration with uh, theories from neighboring disciplines. Um, for instance, uh, we already draw quite a bit on, on strategy when we look at the role of uh, international mobility in, in knowledge transfer. Uh, the article by Florence de Vivier I mentioned earlier uh, actually built on an earlier article that I did with Marcus Podelko and Sebastian Reich uh, on uh, the role of expatriates and impatriates in uh, knowledge transfer. And um, this perspective is increasingly popular in, in the strategy literature where they talk about the micro foundations of strategy, so how individuals in an organization uh, contribute. Then another area of research that we can and should draw on is diaspora and migration research, where uh, researchers have done a lot of work on social networks um, of the diaspora and uh, migrants, international trade uh, resulting from these networks and international entrepreneurship, uh, because migrants are uh, typically more likely to get engaged in international uh, entrepreneurship. One key example is an article by Maria Elo, um, who is looking at female migrants um, who suffer from what she calls brain waste uh, in multiple ways uh, due to institutional aspects, due to discrimination and um, partly also to um, inherent social cultural norms in particular countries. So she provides recommendations on how private and public sectors can improve female uh, talent perception and integrate uh, female uh, talent better um, in their organizations. And then there is another area of research which over the years, over the last 25 years, have moved from being on the periphery of international business to almost being in the mainstream of international business, the language in international business. Uh, a recent article by uh, Ivan uh, Volkanov uh, in Journal of Global Mobility uh, talks about how uh, language related topics are really not yet common practice in international mobility research and um, most studies actually completely ignore language apart from language training uh, for expatriates but language is important in selection in adjustment in knowledge transfer but also in building up trust between um, expatriates and uh, local employees. So one area we should certainly draw more on uh, in terms of international mobility research is international organization behavior and here we're dealing with topics such as identity and identity change, uh, ethnic versus cultural similarity, issues of leadership, issues of teamwork um, and maybe even virtual teams. I'm picking out two articles here, both written by uh, my former PhD student. Uh, the first one uh, of ostriches, frogs, bizet, uh, birds and lizards, 
uh, looked at expatriations and um, their cultural identity negotiation strategies where we argue that expatriates actually might choose different identity negotiation strategies in different contexts and we use an animal analogy for this and if you want to figure out which animal does what you'll have to read the article. And then the second uh, article um, by Shefan is looking at um, expatriates who um, are ethnically similar but culturally different um, from uh, the country uh, they are sent to. So for instance uh, Chinese Americans or Australian Americans. Um, and they expect um, to have an easier time uh, than, say, Western, uh, white Western expatriates in these countries because um, they might have a natural affinity um, with the culture, but in reality they find um, that they're facing all sorts of challenges. Um, and uh, we've written up uh, a practitioner article uh, that carefully documents uh, the key challenges that they're facing. And then another area that we could draw more on is the area of gender and diversity. And obviously there have been studies on, on female uh, expatriates, but um, simply as a, as a comparison group. So how do female expatriates differ from male expatriates, for instance? But in a recent um, conference paper, um, we argue that um, the lack of uh, mobility for female managers and um, their lack of opportunity to go on international assignments might actually have serious career um, prospects and damaging career um, effects uh, for female managers. And then obviously um, a final area that international mobility research could draw on is human resource management. This effect has um, or already been done to quite a significant uh, extent, especially in the uh, area of talent management, um, where Sada and Brewster uh, seven years ago um, already published a paper on uh, integrating talent management and expatriation and defining global talent management, which would be a combination of high potential development and global careers. So, so far we've looked mostly at uh, drawing theoretical foundations from other disciplines within uh, business and management. But obviously we uh, can look much further than this and, and look at the other social sciences. For instance, I, I came across this very intriguing article in um, geography. Um, Privileged mobilities, locating the expatriate in migration scholarships. Uh, the article talks about migrants who are privileged by citizenship, class or race are largely still absent from mainstream migration research and theory. So the exact opposite of what we've seen in international mobility research. They are clearly trying to learn from us. So we should certainly try and learn from what is published in geography as well. And then um, Earlier we talked about uh, the length of um, expatriation. Um, so if we're talking about temporary expatriation, why not draw from tourism as well? A former colleague of mine, Ting Ting Li, um, has uh, looked at how diaspora um, tourists construct social capital. This is something that could be very useful um, for international mobility research as well. And then obviously there is sociology, a discipline uh, which puts the phenomena in a wider societal perspective. And a great example is, is this book uh, which looks at expatriate identities in post-colonial organizations and looks at how post-colonial relationships impact on expatriation and how it is perceived. And then the discipline of economics uh, that has looked, for instance, at um, labor market issues uh, related to expatriation. For instance, this article looking at regulations uh, in the form of quota on a number of expatriates and how this impacts on the employment uh, conditions of locals. 
So geography, tourism, sociology, economics. We can also think about political science, history, anthropology, communication studies. I think we should cast the net much more widely than we've done to date. And then research methods. As I mentioned earlier, to date the international mobility literature has largely relied on surveys, interviews and secondary data. But I think we can be much more creative than that. For instance, uh, look at um, experiments, which my uh, former PhD student, Chia Fan, has used quite a bit. Um, in her PhD, for instance, um, she uh, used vignettes in a field experiment uh, with um, employees of multinational corporations in China, in which she included scenarios in which uh, ethnic similarity was either emphasized or de-emphasized and tested how that impacted on uh, host country employees' attitudes uh, towards expatriates. She's also written up uh, a book chapter on uh, using experiments um, in international business um, in the book Managing Multilingual Workplaces. And then uh, dyadic surveys. So these are still surveys, but um, they um, are targeted at both parties of a relationship. So if we're talking about international mobility research, that's often the expatriates and the host country employee. So again, in her PhD, Shefan asked both the expatriates and their local counterpart to answer a survey and these surveys were then matched to compare their responses. So these were all very quantitative methods but obviously we can look at qualitative methods as well and go beyond interview studies. Uh, one very exciting article I saw recently used a, a diary study uh, studying um, the distinct um, role of four different social groups in the expatriate social network. So the host country nationals, the home country nationals, uh, the key uh, foreign expatriates and compatriots on expatriate adjustment. Um, and they reasoned that they really wanted to do exploratory research. Um, so a diary study to document these relationships uh, was ideal for them. And then uh, ethnography, which is a research method that has uh, been used increasingly in, in international business research by academics such as Mario Kalbranen and Fiona Moore, uh, but which hasn't today really found any significant usage in international mobility research. And then I think we need to be honest that a lot of the research um, in our field has been very academically focused. Um, focusing mainly about making a small contribution to the literature rather than um, looking at a broader canvas and see how we can actually help addressing some of today's key challenges. And obviously, if we're talking about international mobility in particular, this has been hugely impacted by uh, global challenges such as climate change and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So very obvious questions would be, um, can we replace the knowledge transfer control, coordination and management development roles of expatriation with other means? Um, can we um, maybe use more third country nationals uh, rather than parent country nationals if mobility in some countries remains restricted? Um, I'm certainly not the first one, of course, to, um, to argue for this. And in fact, a lot of colleagues in, in recent years have done exactly this. Uh, you will probably have seen uh, a recent special issue in uh, the global uh, Journal of Global Mobility on um, expatriation in a VUCA world, um, an environment characterized by volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. Um, there's also been an increasing number of people uh, working on migrants um, and uh, refugees. 
uh, with a, a really excellent um, article by uh, Lee uh, and um, a couple of co-authors who um, review and synthesize um, the literature on refugee employment and uh, workforce integration and introduce a concept uh, which they call the canvas ceiling, which is a, a systematic barrier to um, refugee workforce integration and obviously a play um, on the words glass ceiling that uh, are used for another minority group, women. Bettina Schluderek has also uh, done some great work in this area and I really encourage you to uh, visit uh, the URL which um, has some really um, exciting videos uh, about uh, the work she has done. It's also an excellent example of um, how to disseminate your research uh, to a broader audience in uh, an attractive format. And then there have been some key uh, review uh, articles um, in uh, journals such as Journal of International Business Study and the Journal of International Business Studies and Journal of World Business, um, looking at key societal challenges um, and also um, reviewing the literature in the last 30 years and then looking forward. Um, if you are interested in really making a difference, I would strongly encourage you to study these two articles carefully. And then last but not least, some journals have started to experiment uh, with new submission formats. Um, for instance, the Journal of World Business has started um, a new rapid review uh, process, which um, is really meant for topics with um, uh, big societal and, and practical uh, relevance, uh, where um, academics can submit papers that will be really rapidly reviewed. Okay, so we've talked about the need to broaden our study populations, to ensure a better theoretical integration with business and management research, uh, for the need uh, for interdisciplinary research, uh, the need to expand our repertoire of methods and the need to embark on research that addresses key societal challenges. There are two more things, however, that I would really like to impress on you and they are don't be afraid to be different and don't be afraid to be critical. So first of all, and somewhat paradoxically, um, we all study what we are familiar with, so don't feel you need to apologize for this. Don't feel that you need to apologize for studying female expatriates as a female academic. Don't feel you have to apologize for uh, studying expatriates in your home country. Remember, the seminal researchers in this field did me search too. They were white, male, generally Anglo uh, academics studying white, male, generally Anglo uh, expatriates. That's perfectly fine. Different populations, different researchers should study different populations. And in fact, um, if I look at the recent book I published with two of my former uh, PhD students, Lin Zhong and Xie Fan, managing expatriates in China, their familiarity with the country context was a key draw card of the book. Second, try to leverage author collaborations uh, across ethnic boundaries. Many publications, in fact, um, have authors of similar ethnicity, whether, whether that's white Western, Asian or, or African. And if there are collaborations, they tend to be non-Western juniors writing with their Western, white Western uh, PhD supervisors. And, the juniors are socialized into Western perspectives. In our recent paper in organization studies with Hunjun Lee and, and Katsu Yoshikama, uh, we were trying to provide a fresh perspective on country of origin effects uh, on multinational staffing policies. And um, the paper took probably about eight years all in all to get published from first ideas to publication. However, I think our conversations about the topic from different national and ethic, ethnic perspectives, Korean, Japanese and Dutch, led to a much better paper. And I really enjoyed our collaboration. So I'm kind of sorry the paper is published now. And then third, be brave enough to write less formulaic papers. 
Uh, a recent paper I published with Marcus Purelko in Management International Review is in fact a, a combination between a perspective paper, a literature review and an empirical paper all used to argue that cultural distance as a concept is overused and that entry mode choice can actually be explained much better by home and host country uh, cultural and institutional factors than by cultural distance. I won't deny it was hard to get the paper published, but I'm really happy that we stuck to our current format because I think it's all the more impactful for it. And then finally, don't feel you have to publish every single paper in an A-journal. There are different outlets for different types of work. You might enjoy listening to my YouTube video on this, which outlines at least seven different types of outlets. And also don't forget that whether before or after publication, engagement with social media can be a really good way to bring your research to a broader audience. Okay, then last but not least, be critical. Don't think that established theories are set in stone. They're not holy. They might in fact be based on very, very simple research methods, very limited samples. If I look at my own paper in Journal of World Business in 2001, it had extremely simplistic statistical analysis. And the typology that I came up with, bears, bumblebees and spiders, this was just something that came out of a conversation with my husband. And I was just so surprised to hear young PhD students at conferences talking about it 15 years later as if this was like an established thing and they couldn't touch it. Of course not. Research is progress. It's not about treating prior work as set in stone. And then don't feel you have to wait until you're a full professor to be allowed to be critical. Even as a PhD student, you are allowed to criticize other people's work, as long as you do it with justification and with respect. My first ever article that I published in the International Journal of HRM in, in 1995, The Persistent Myth of High Expatriate Failure Rates, um, was in fact a, a very critical article in a way because it showed that um, there was a myth that expatriate failure rates were incredibly high and that was created by massive misreferencing of three articles and only one of these articles contained solid empirical evidence and it showed to be uh, expatriate failure rates to be rather low. I did kind of pause for a while and think should I publish this but I talked about it with my, my PhD supervisor Arne Sorger um, and he said go ahead science is about progress. And I can't say that, that anyone has reacted negatively uh, on, uh, to me about this. Um, I might have had some, some strange glances at conferences, but overall, I think the article was very well received. And even though the article was well received, people did in fact continue to make the same claim. So after about five or six years, um, I thought maybe I should phrase this slightly differently. So I tried to um, bring this at a higher level and say, well, maybe it's about inadequate referencing. So I wrote an article about our, our referencing errors undermining our scholarship and credibility. So um, even if you don't get it right the first time, you can possibly reframe the same message um, at a higher level or in a slightly different perspective and publish it in another uh, article, in, in another journal, making another contribution. And in fact, the article I published with Marcus Pudelko that I mentioned earlier was um, the second uh, try to get the same message across. I tried this before uh, in 2004, uh, but that was uh, just a literature review, uh, whereas in um, the 2016 article, we made a more extensive conceptual argument and also had empirical work. So you can revisit earlier work as well, making it more impactful as you go along. So, dare to be different. Um, 
how does this work in practice? How to navigate academia as a PhD student or an early career researcher? And apologies for being a bit self-indulgent here and talking mainly about my own experience, but that's obviously the experience I'm, I'm most familiar with. And for me, um, it's captured well in these uh, two images. Um, the left-hand image is certainly me organized, structured, like to have everything in its right hand, in its right place. But the right hand image is also me, um, more playful, more flexible, trying, up, trying to come up with different ideas from different perspectives um, in very different, sometimes clashing colors, which incidentally were the colors of the walls and the woodwork of the first uh, house I've ever bought. So. I'll spend the rest of the presentation to go through a number of steps to discuss how you would do this in practice. I think there are at least three key things that are important when building a, a successful academic career and they can be neatly summarized as AIB, Academy of International Business, but also ask for advice, take an investment view of your career and be true to yourself or believe in yourself. Well, first of all, I would say ask for advice. Don't struggle with every single problem on your own. We all like to be independent, but remember, you're not the first to experience this problem. And there are plenty of people out there who are happy to help you. Participate in networks, formal or informal. Uh, you might want to join online webinars. You will have noticed that in COVID-19 times, uh, the number of webinars has exploded, content-oriented, method-oriented, skills development-oriented, you name it, anything. And then don't hesitate to write to senior academics. Just send them an email. Some of them might never respond, but many of them are actually perfectly happy to help junior academics. But try and be specific in your question um, so that it doesn't take up a huge amount of, your, of their time to answer you. And then in your daily working life, um, as a teacher, um, as someone participating in the life of the department, as a researcher, if you're uncertain whether um, something that's asked of you can be expected at your stage of career, just ask around with your colleagues um, and um, don't hesitate to ask for a second opinion. There's a lot of advice available online. Uh, you can look at blogs and fora such as The Professor Is In, Thesis Whisperer, if you're a PhD student, Research Whisperer, if you're an early career academic. Um, I've started um, my own blog in 2016, I think, and by now there are more than 250 posts about every imaginable topic. So just Google it and uh, you'll find some advice. Well, second point I would say, invest. Invest in your own career. Invest in acquiring new skills, accumulating experience and building up strong relationships with colleagues all over the world. Try and see new tasks that are asked of you as a learning opportunity, not a chore. And to be honest, in the first five to ten years of your academic career, you will spend, and sometimes it feels waste, a huge amount of time doing lots of things for the first time but believe me it's all learning and it will pay off later in your career and in in terms of careers try as much as possible i know it's hard sometimes but to take a long-term perspective um, some academic careers might spend four or five decades and not everything will pay off instantly and some things to be honest never do um, so that's why you need to have a balanced portfolio. We talked earlier about not wanting to publish everything in an A journal. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. And then I would say don't get angry or frustrated if you don't make it to associate professor or full professor within a somewhat artificial time limit that you've set yourself. Try and enjoy the journey and don't burn out or, or lose your motivation before you get there. And once you get there, try and help others um, to achieve the same goals. 
And that's actually something I feel quite strongly about. Um, in academic careers, it's important in any career, but certainly in an academic career, to do things for others uh, without necessarily expecting a return on investment. And even if you do that, you might actually find that it helps you in some way in your own career. If I look at my own case, my website, which I've been running for well over 20 years now, uh, the journal quality list, uh, the publisher parish software, my blog. I never did any of these things expecting to gain something from this personally. But even though these initiatives take up a huge amount of my time and I could have spent that time publishing papers or applying for research funding or just taking time off and do something fun, they have given me a great name recognition um, and they probably get my work read more than it would otherwise have been. So, number three, believe in yourself, be true to yourself. Yes, you do absolutely need to be strategic to get ahead. You need to compromise. Sometimes you simply have to give in a little to get what you want ultimately, but don't compromise yourself, don't compromise your values, don't compromise what you stand for in academic career. And when you're young and, and, and struggling to get an academic foothold, it's only natural to be a little envious when looking at senior academics who seem to be in very comfortable positions. But do understand that everyone has their own career and personal struggles. You don't know what other people have gone through. So what matters is not really what obstacles you encounter in your academic career, but how resilient you are and how able and willing you are to learn from failure. And I would encourage you to put yourself in your own shoes in 10 years time. What would you like to have achieved in 10 years time? And what do you, do to do, what do you need to do right now to get there? And also think about what will you become in 10 years time if you continue to work in the way you do now? And do you actually like that? If not, change. So, did I, did I actually apply this advice in my own PhD? Or, of course, not consciously, because I hadn't come up with this acronym by now. But I think subconsciously, um, I did apply what I'm advising you to do now. I did ask for advice. I did reach out to senior academics. Um, I contacted lots of people, including people like Paul Evans, uh, Denise Welch, um, Gunnar Hetlund. I, I, I still have the, the faxes that uh, Paul Evans sent me. There, wasn't e there was no email at the time. Um, they're almost faded, but I still treasure them. Um, I also spent um, lots of time, uh, invested lots of time learning about the logistics of international meal surveys because there wasn't a lot of material out there uh, and learning about the kind of incentives that I could use to get people to respond. And believing in myself was quite easy um, because my supervisors um, they were very flexible. They were not subject experts, but uh, they believed in me. So that made me believe in myself. They didn't tell me you can't do this. So I just went ahead and did it. However, I will say that it is also extremely important to be resilient and patient. In terms of my PhD, before being passed without changes by two prominent IB researchers in the UK and published in Peter Buckley's New Horizons in the International Business Series, the very same manuscript was all but rejected at a Dutch university by the internal examiners, mainly because it didn't conform to the format they expected. So again, patience and resilience is crucial. So, in, in case you're curious about how research was conducted uh, more than 25 years ago, um, I've, I've included some sample materials from uh, my PhD here. In the middle, you can see the announcement postcard uh, that I sent uh, before I sent the questionnaire package. It has some key questions that my research would be able um, to answer. And then second, I, I came up with uh, what I think was a bit of a quirky incentive to get people um, to respond to the, the questionnaire which was a tea bag which was attached to the letter next to a PS um, saying something like, why don't you take a short break um, and have a nice cup of tea, complete the questionnaire right now. It will only take you 10 to 15 minutes. 
And then in the reminder, I also sent a reminder letter. Um, I included a session of, of instant coffee rather than uh, tea, um, saying something like, well, maybe uh, you haven't had a chance to respond yet because you, you don't really like tea and you prefer coffee. I, I think the slight quirkiness of it helped uh, to uh, get people to pay attention. So remember, I said earlier, ask for advice. Um, I did ask uh, lots of people, uh, not necessarily for advice, but I asked them whether they were willing to be part of my committee of recommendation because I was sending a questionnaire to 23, 24 different countries. And I reasoned that people in those countries would relate more to an academic uh, from the same country. And virtually everyone I asked agreed. So in this image, you can see the committee of recommendation as well as a picture of myself. I also asked um, the respondents um, at the back of the questionnaire um, what they like most and least about the questionnaire. And interestingly, they did often say that uh, the personal approach was really what they liked about the questionnaire. So I also offered respondents um, uh, a company report. Um, they could even get this if they prefer to stay anonymous because they send, could send back a separate postcard and you can see this represented uh, at the top right. Um, and in the end, after the study was uh, completed, I did complete uh, a company report. You can see some of the pages here. It might look quite simplistic today. But 25 years ago, I can assure you this looked pretty fancy. Um, I even offered um, companies to uh, create tailored reports for them on particular topics and industries um, if they were willing to pay for it. And to my big surprise, some of them actually were. Okay, and then to end up this presentation, I would like to get a little philosophical if you, you don't mind. And for forgive me for, for sounding maybe a bit like your mother, but having worked in, in academia for uh, more than 30 years now, I think that some of these reflections might be useful. Um, as academics, we're often very, very critical of our uh, own workplaces and, and often rightly so, but we do need to realize that the world uh, has changed around us and that we are still in careers that despite everything, offer us considerable independence and opportunity to work with amazingly talented people on a daily basis and learn from them, whether it's our students, whether it's our collaborators, whether it's our seniors. So one reason why academia can be a really, really hard job for some people is that it might seem like it's an almost constant stream of rejections. Rejections of funding applications, rejections of uh, articles you submit to journals, sometimes even rejections felt by students if you get student evaluations and it, it turns out they don't like your course. In thinking about this, it might help if we compare ourselves not uh, what we often do as business school academics uh, with CEOs or, or other successful business people, but rather with another profession where people also care about realizing their visions, being independent, not wanting to work for a boss and do work that is strongly driven by their values and passion. And I'm talking about artists here. Think about Actors who need to audition for every single new role and get rejected 99 times out of 100. I think as academics, we still have strike rates better than that, even in the top journals. Um, and only 2% of them make a living defined as about 20,000 a year. And even though as academics, we might claim we're not as well paid as we should be, we make more, way more than that. And then looking at another key aspect of our job, teaching. A lot of academics might be quite frustrated at having to teach below what they feel is their academic level. And uh, if you've been teaching for quite a while, you might well be of the opinion that every generation of students is worse than the previous one. Um, but spare a thought for another group of artists, painters, sculptors, musicians. 
many of them in order to make a living they teach school kids um, who are completely uninterested in creative pursuits and just have to do this as part of their classes or um, they teach talented adult, adults who just want to draw their cats or want to make vases or, or, or house numbers. My father, who you can see portrayed here, has been doing exactly that for most of his career. And of course, I know that their working in academia can be extremely stressful, especially at the current times. It can sometimes even be soul destroying. But I would encourage you to, to count your blessings, um, especially at business schools. We, we do have a tendency, as I said before, to complain about our salaries, uh, compare ourselves to CEOs or, or consultants, even though most of us wouldn't last a week in those roles. I'm sure, absolutely sure I wouldn't. So I think it's far more constructive um, to see ourselves like artists. And despite all of the limitations that we are facing, we can still follow our own path, our own passion, whilst having much higher salaries and more job security, despite the recent troubles, than artists have. But I would like to extend a call to more senior academics to really take an active role in shaping the academic culture so that our junior academics can continue to enjoy these benefits and the blog post listed on this slide refers to this. Okay, thank you Anvil very much for your inspiring, encouraging and interesting presentation and I just before opening the questions I wanted to say to you that there are many people who thank you for this presentation. They're very, as I said, encouraged and inspired. And uh, one comment is that your continued service to the research community is greatly appreciated by scholars world, worldwide. Thank you for all that you do. I liked very much the comment that I would like to, and I fully uh, you know, agree with this, that, that the paper on the myth of high expatriate failure rate was not only um, so that this is coming from uh, Vasily Taras, my favorite paper of the time, but one that also showed that it's okay and even necessary to question prior work. So thank you very much. This is very interesting. So dare to be different. This is a very good question. So we have one question regarding the interdisciplinarity. Um, so there is so much to learn from other disciplines. So one um, participant asks, and uh, do you have any tip on how to blend smoothly different disciplines? Because reviewers and editors as well may not be familiar with other disciplines like history, political sciences, etc. Yeah, yeah, I, that, that's really an excellent question because the problem is that we all get these recommendations, do more interdisciplinary research. And yes, we all agree with this, but then how to do this um, in practice? I think this is this probably a couple of things um, to take into account here. First of all, pick your, your journal well, uh, because some journals are more open to interdisciplinary research than others. Um, and we have to be honest in that. Um, if you look at um, the international HRM research, global mobility research, um, a journal like Journal of International Business Studies, by its nature, is more multidisciplinary than some other journals because international business is always drawn from lots of different disciplines. Other journals might be more focused um, in specific disciplines. If um, you look at some of the um, psychology journals that publish organization behavior research, they might draw very much on psychology work only. But if you do submit um, a, a, a paper where you draw from different disciplines to a journal, I think you really need to think carefully about how you contribute to the, the conversation in the journal. So you draw on these other disciplines, you bring them in, but you explain how they are relevant for the discipline, the conversation you're contributing to in that journal, in your article. Um, so you, you explain um, why this disciplinary knowledge is illuminating for the question you're asking. But then, of course, you need to explain um, a little bit about um, the contents 
um, of the articles you're drawing on because not everyone might be familiar uh, with that discipline. So it's a way of packaging it. I would also say um, when you submit a journal article that, that draws on very multidisciplinary um, approaches, um, in your letter to the editor, explain very carefully why you think this is relevant and why you think this is a strength of, of, of the journal. Um, and um, I think um, Maral said, well, some editors might not like it either. I think in general, editors are your friends. You might not believe this, but we actually had a, um, a seminar yesterday at, at Middlesex University where David Collins um, uh, talked about his experience as, a, as an editor. And editors really want to publish new and exciting work and, and work that draws people to the journal and that people kind of stand up and it's like, oh my God, this is something really exciting. It's often the reviewers who, I would say are your enemies, but who come up with, no, you can't do this, no, you can't do that, because they are more vested interests in the field. So try, don't, don't, um, don't be scared to try it, but do have other people read your papers before you submit it to the journal. Uh, because they might be able to help you to frame this in um, a language that is acceptable in that journal, even if you draw on multidisciplinary approaches. Okay, thank you, Anu. Uh, I, I like another question, which is a bit different. Uh, if you could go back in time and do it all over again, would you do anything differently? <laughs> so, what would you do differently? <laughs> that, because that's... your journey was so inspiring. So. <laughs> It's interesting to know, would you change something? Yeah, that's a very good question. I see Vas asking that, that question. Um, I, I, I don't think, um, I don't think I would, um, because um, we all make decisions uh, all the time in our career and we deal with um, the opportunities we have at the time, uh, the constraints we have at that particular time, um, and the options we, we, we have at that time. So I find that question like, if you could go back, yes, but if you would go back, the situation would be different. Um, you know now much more than you did in the past, so you look at that situation very different. Uh, I, it's about asking, do you have any regrets? Um, no, not really. I think we all make the choices we make um, in, in our lives and we all try to make the best choices. What I do think is really important though is especially for junior academics um, because there's, there's now all these webinars as well with famous IB academics um, and um, it, it's easy if you look at these academics to think, oh my God, there's no way I, I, I can do this. But you don't know what opportunities these people have had. They might have had the opportunity to have a great education that you have not had because you um, come from a country where um, you don't have great universities or you don't have the money to go to a great university. Um, so we all have our own opportunities. We all have our own constraints. If you're trying to build a career with young children, it's much more difficult uh, than when uh, you don't have children or you have a partner staying at home, taking care of the children. So don't try and model yourself on these famous academics. We, we all have our own career path to carve out. So um, no, I won't go back and do things differently. And the other thing I will say about that is um, um, sometimes it's better not to know what's ahead of you, uh, because if we all knew what was ahead of us, you would probably be, be paralyzed. You wouldn't do anything because you would see all the problems ahead of you as well. Sometimes it's better just to do things. Um, and um, I won't say um, in spite of all the consequences, but just do things. And especially as PhD students, don't always listen. You need to listen to your supervisors, obviously. But um, if you truly believe that what you want to do is the best course of action, don't let others tell you that won't work. I've tried it, it doesn't work. Maybe it will work. 
if you do it because you do it in a more creative way you do it better um, so again don't try and live someone else's academic career great so dare to be different actually and just yeah. do it yeah this is uh, great uh, so one participant is asking what about publications is it okay to publish as more as possible but not in uh, high level journals or to publish fewer but only top journals because actually yes there is ongoing conversation between supervisors and phd students yeah yeah this is another really really good question um I think the answer to that is is very much dependent on again two things you as an academic your opportunities you your personality and the type of university you want to work for um if you were want to work for one of the top 10 universities in the world um, it is likely that um, they will want you to publish in the top journals and you won't be shortlisted for a job if you don't have publications in these, these top journals. But there are thousands and thousands of universities in the world and there are universities um, that um, have more of a focus on applied research, which typically doesn't get published as easily in top journals. Um, so if that's where your passion lies, then don't get up, go and apply uh, for the top universities because they will, will force you in a particular direction that you don't want to go. Um, and then in general, like with everything, try if you can to have a bit of a mix. Um, if you have one or two publications in top journals as a young scholar, that's great because you, you've shown you can do it. But you don't need to do only that um, because you might have many interesting ideas and to get a publication published in a top journal in some cases it might take years and years do you really want to spend three years of your life on a single publication whereas you could also do three or four different projects that you're all passionate about and and maybe published in a lower level journal, but it's still out there. People can still read it. People can still use it. And we will all have this, this experience um, once we've published um, a number of articles that it's not always our, our, our articles in the top journals that are the ones that are the most read or the most cited or uh, the most useful to people. So try and, and find a mix that works for you, for your institution. And also consider, are you going to stay in that institution or that country for the rest of your academic career? Or do you want to be mobile and work in other countries? Um, and then do these other countries have different requirements? Um, so it's all about you and the fit, person environment fits, um, as they say. Yeah, that's great. So actually, it's, uh, there is a smooth trans transition from what you said lastly uh, about being mobile, maybe changing countries. And then we have another question. Uh, actually, we have several um, participants who would like to start their PhDs, but late in their careers, like 40s after being already in corporate world. So what mm -hmm. would you advise to do this? And mm -hmm. uh, I would like to combine it with another question asking, uh, as you changed um, environments, different schools in different countries, would you say that there are some countries or some schools uh, who, which are um, nurturing, this is the word from um, the question, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. academics and make it yeah. easy to achieve academic success? Um, late career academics um i think it really again depends on um your own goals and ambitions and the the university uh, you work for um i i know quite a few colleagues um at any institution i've worked for who have started a phd in their 40s often after working in in, in industry for for 20 years or more in some cases um completed a phd and have had a successful academic career i can think of at least three um who um are now full professor um 
but obviously um, it means that in your mid 40s, late 40s, maybe even early 50s, you're starting out as a junior in what is or can be in some countries, at least quite a hierarchical system. So are you able after a successful academic career to go back to that position of a junior being the one who during their PhDs needs to learn lots of things and then in their career needs to be a junior member of staff. At the same time, <clears throat> lots of universities and my, my current university included really love academics like that because they have all the business experience that students absolutely adore because they can give real life examples in the classroom. They can talk about industries with inside knowledge um, and um, they also know why they are in academia. They don't keep complaining like academia is such a horrible place and, and I can't imagine why anyone would like to be an academic these days. It's, so many older academics say this. Um, but these people have worked in industry and they have realized that industry is not paradise either. Um, so they have very, very motivated. It's, it's kind of a side story, but I, I also love um, uh, people who become a nurse um, in their 40s because um, they're really committed um, to making that transition and they, they've really chosen the profession because they love it. Whereas if you start as a nurse in your early 20s, by the time you're mid 40s, you're probably burned out. Um, so yes, we work for 40 years, 45 years, 50 years, some of us. You can have two careers or three careers or four careers within one career and one of them can be academic one of them can be industry um if you want me to answer the question about countries i can but if you prefer me to answer another question i, I can do that too so as you wish actually <laughs> there, there is one question as we are now in this covid situation is uh i would like again combine two questions so one is how to manage ethnographic research amidst pan the pandemic what mm -hmm. other methods can I adopt in this case? And another question is, yes, how can we help practitioners to cope with this situation? Yeah. So, I mean, you choose uh, which one. Yeah. And I think it will be the last question because we are running we, out of time. We're running out of time. Um, the, the, the country one, by the way, again, I don't think it's about countries, um, but it's, it's, it's often about institutions within countries because every country has institutions uh, across a whole range. Um, um, so what can we do in, in the, um, the pandemic? There are just so many topics that, 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 that are crucial right now, but a lot of these, these topics, and, and I'll, maybe I'll stick with one which is, is, is very relevant to our current situation, online meetings, virtual teams. Um, these have been around for a long time. Um, but it's somehow the research in that area was, was, was kind of fairly isolated. Now it's become mainstream because it's all our experience. So um, in terms of international mobility, if, if we can't be internationally mobile, how do we make sure that people get this immersive cross-cultural experience that they need to work cross-culturally? Are there any other ways to do this? Um, virtual teamwork um, is this how do we build trust in virtual teams and um, does this differ um, in terms of teams that um, have already met each other face to face before or are new virtual teams leadership in virtual teams uh, there are so many issues in terms of inclusion in virtual teams is inclusion um, easier to achieve in virtual environments than in physical environments, or is it more difficult? So our whole move to a virtual world, I think has, has brought up lots of issues. Um, there are many others as well. Um, and in terms of another question that I, I saw in, in, in the chat about grand societal challenges and, and, and publishing, um, you will have noticed that loads and loads of journals have special issues on these. Uh, topics and in these um, these areas this moment so 
I'm cautiously optimistic that um, we are going in the right direction in, in our research in that we are becoming more multidisciplinary, we are becoming more concerned about grand challenges, we are becoming more concerned about our research applying to practice. And now we also see the top journals really asking for this kind of research. And we had incidental initiatives in the past, but COVID has really kind of in some way transformed um, the, um, the journal landscape. And I'm, I'm really hoping that this is permanent. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Anu, very much again, once more for your presentation. Uh, just to conclude, uh, I would like to repeat again for the participants that this talk is a part of series again. And the next one is scheduled on May 21st, where Vlad Weiman will talk about talent management. So please come, uh, looking forward to this. And uh, I will thank you very much again. Very inspiring, very encouraging. I suppose, especially for younger academics, but uh, I mean, for everyone. And uh, to all colleagues, thanks you very much as well, involved in the organization of this um, webinar. And uh, of course, thank you to all of you, to participants to come. Uh, thank you very much and hope to see you again in uh, three weeks. Bye-bye. You know, can I say one more thing, Maral? Of course. <laughs> I noticed lots of questions still in the chat. Um, um, I will try and, and save the chat. Some of you have asked really specific questions about your research. Um, I'm happy if you send me an email um, to answer you one-on-one. -on -one. I think that, that would be more useful um, than um, try, me trying to, to answer in the Q&A. Great. Thank you again for your developmental mindset. Thank you very much and uh, bye bye.